you. God bless you. Looking spectacular. Your worship is heartfelt, and um, our love for you is heartfelt. Your love for us has been heartfelt. We thank you so much. God is so amazing. Come on, can you just take one second and stand with me? And I know you just sat down a minute ago. <laughs> can you just tell Jesus, can we just take turns? I mean, not turns, but take the time to tell Jesus what he means to us right now. Just personally, just, I'm going to turn my mic off so I can talk to him. Your name, Lord, we thank you for salvation that is so full and free. We thank you for this country. We thank you for founding fathers. We thank you for the faith of our fathers. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for all this abundance that has been given to us, Lord, all that we've inherited, all that you've blessed us with. Lord, we thank you for our moms and our dads, our children, our families. We thank you for a space and a time where a country can come aside and say, thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. We just bless you and thank you. Just raise your right hand and bless the Lord. Just bless his name. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord. We bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hey, raise your left hand also. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. You have been filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much. I love what God is doing in your families. I love rejoicing with you. I love what God has done in our lives and through our lives. I love being married to Judy. I love our kids, our grandkids. I love our extended family here at Cornerstone. It's just so cool. Amen? It's all good. How many of you had a good dad? Raise your hand. A good dad. No, if, you're, if, if he was really good, don't be ashamed, okay? Raise your hand. You know. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How many of you had a different kind of dad? All right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I should have clarified what different kind of dad meant. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I'll tell a story on David since he did that. We had a prophet come through one time, and he prophesied over David, and he said, your humor will get you in trouble. I love it. I love his humor. I love God's humor. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Um, I was thinking back... Uh, at Christmas time, I think when you know we, we get into the holidays, it just becomes a big blur, you know. And uh, at Christmas time or Thanksgiving, then next thing you know, it's Christmas time. Um, you know, my my parents gave us wonderful Christmas, the best they could do. But one particular year, after uh, my brother and I had been learning to play guitars, they just just blew us away and. We had two new guitars and two new amplifiers, which in the 1970s, you know, which would have cost a small fortune as it would today. Um, David's guitar, or David, my brother Steve's guitar was brand new, brand new, spanking. Boy, if we had that guitar today. Man, that thing and those amplifiers, they're still selling for a great price, you know. And, and the one I had was actually really pretty upscale, but it was used, and that didn't make it any less. It was amazing. I wish I still had that, that bass guitar, but somehow, some way, my parents uh, blessed us with that. And, you know, that's not what makes for good parenting. It's not what makes for good Christmas, but it's a memory of mine that even yet today, I, I still can't fathom how they pulled that off. I just want to thank you, Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad's with Jesus, you know. So how they did that just, is just beyond me. But that's, you know, good fathers, good parents do the nurturing part. So we're a product of nurture and nature, you know. So some of it's genetic, some of it's inherited, some of it's, uh, you know, um, 
inherited from Adam and Eve. Uh, you know, some of it, quite frankly, is genetic, and some of it is the kind of things that people nurture in our lives. And uh, if your childhood experience was great, then your perception of a dad or mom might be great. If your childhood was not so great, your perception of moms or dads might be different than that, you know. And I find ourselves to be in a time when people are um, oftentimes very indifferent about their parents, you know, or their parenting, maybe until they start having their own kids, you know, and then all of a sudden things start to change. And I can tell you that I was probably not as gracious of a son as I should have been, but I can tell you this, that looking back, my parents did a great job providing for us everything they could. That's just my testimony. And a spiritual inheritance that goes several generations deep, you know, and I, I don't know what I would do without that. If that's not your experience, guess what? It's not too late to begin your own legacy, to begin your own experience, to begin to experience. This is what I love about God is he, like, invites us all into his family, just invites us right in. And that's really what I want to talk about again today, but, but I want to do it the way I started last week, and that is that I shared with you what I believe is the most frightening or concerning verse in the New Testament. <clears throat> it's found in Luke chapter 18, verse number 8. Jesus said, I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Literally, the faith. That phrase right there has been bouncing around in my spirit for, for weeks now. And, and, and that is a responsibility to say, okay, what is the faith? And the faith that we have received, is it the one that Jesus planted? The faith that we're handing on, is it the one that Jesus planted? It's a fair question. When Jesus asks a question, he already knows the answer to it. But we don't. When he returns, will he find? When Jesus returns, how many of you know the Lord is coming back? How many happy about that? <laughs> How many want to just get out of Dodge, you know? <clears throat> How many just want to see Jesus? Do you love Jesus and you just, you know, life is good, but heaven is probably better, you know? And so um, why wouldn't we want to see the Lord return? I, I want to take that thought and, and sort of turn the corner and say, after we've asked ourselves the question, um, Will he find, will Jesus find the same faith that he planted on the earth? Will he find that same faith? And we have to turn the corner and say, okay, um, will he find it in me, in us? That's the, that's the real issue. But then after you, you, you wrestle with that at, uh, for some time, then the next thing is, so what is the faith? You know, what is it? And what I want to do is kind of retrace Jesus' description Jesus understanding his teaching to the disciples and what did he teach them? Because we have all been so uh, accustomed to hearing the evangelist and his presentation of the gospel. And what the evangelist usually does is really, in the interest of time, he truncates everything. He just says he gets... He gets you to the place of understanding that you need a Savior, and then that a Savior was provided, and then, um, then it becomes a, a, an exercise of us receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior. And that's kind of what we call the ABCs of the gospel. I've been around this, um, this issue for some time, and I don't disagree with that. I just think that sometimes because we miss this one little important ingredient, which I will call the love of God or the love of the Father, that our message of the gospel gets a little bit skewed and we start to focus more on the need to eliminate sin or to hide from it or to um, somehow cover it or get away from it uh, and, and, and less of an issue on 
recognizing that we have a wonderful Father who's actually invited us home. And Jesus is the way to that home. So over a period of three and a half years, Jesus transferred his faith, his faith in the Father, to the 12. And I just want to stop for a second and say, you know, um, we, we talked about this a little bit on Wednesday night. You know, we, we went around this issue of, you know, what it means to be Christ-like or to become more Christ-like. And I'm always the one in the back of the room saying, time out. I've been around this a while. And I'm going to just tell you that if you ever needed grace, you will always need grace. If you ever were a sinner, you will always be in need of Jesus and his grace. So when you have sinned or when we have sinned, we ought to just confess it and move on, right? Confess it, ask for forgiveness, and move on. But not be surprised that we, uh, and, and, and we shouldn't be surprised that even in churches that we find people who are still trying to juggle and manage their sin. I think it's better to just say, hey, listen, I am not Christ-like. But he lives within me. So my spirit is joined to Jesus. His spirit and my spirit are joined together. And guess what? Because of that, you know, that's full and complete righteousness. In that sense, you'll never be more Christ-like than that. Okay? The issue that we need to think about is our soul. It was mentioned here today. So our bodies are going to die. And um, then they will be resurrected uh, incorruptible. Our spirit is united to Christ. So we got body, we got spirit. But the thing that makes us human is our soul. And the area that needs converted, that needs discipled, that needs counseled, that needs delivered, that needs healed, that is oftentimes broken, is the soul. That's why when you say, David, that King David said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, he's actually saying, look, I'm not an animal. I've got some intelligence, and I want to serve God, and my spirit is united to God, but yet my soul is the area where I'm struggling. It's in the area of my soul. So he rebukes his soul, and he says, you don't feel like worshiping Jesus, but he is still God. He is still the creator. He is still your savior. He's still your deliverer. He is still worth our praise. So we move past our soul when, when we say, okay, um, how do we work this out now? How do we actually live? So between the time that when you realize you need Jesus and the time when he calls us home, there's all this space of living. And in that space, how do we live healthy lives before God? How do we live these lives in a healthy way before God? Well, here's an issue I think that we ought to think about for just a moment. If Jesus said to his disciples in three and a half years, he just kept talking to them about his father. And it was unconventional. He would say, in my father's house. He would say, my father is working and I am working. He would say, I've not doing anything of my own. I, whatever he's doing, that's what I want to join him in. Whatever he is saying, they're not, you know, that's not my words, it's his words, so I will say his words. So what we end up finding is that Jesus was a very good son. So if you want to be Christ-like and not make yourself crazy, endeavor to make yourself a good son. Try to be a good son. Let's try to live our lives as a good son. I want to share with you today a testimony, testimonial. It has a purpose. We have in our house today a good son. Unfortunately, his dad was not always there for him. So it created confusion, Brenner. So I've talked to my friend Jim Zitch, and he's shared with me on other occasions, and I think you should appreciate who Jim is. Not just because he's an amazing pianist, which he is. <clears throat> 
And when he goes to the Hammond B3 setting, I have spiritual experiences. I, beyond all of that, he's just a good friend. And the reason he's a good friend is because he's a good son. But that's in spite of his dad. And we, want, we don't want to dishonor his dad, but we just want to point out to you the difference that it can make. Jim, would you come? Would you welcome him? <clears throat> Good morning. He said I could have two hours and 30 minutes. So, so we don't have to beat the folks down the street to Perkins. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, this is not a story about how terrible my father was. Okay. But in the last, I would say, year and a year and a half, I've been struggling with the love of the father. Um, I re- in the last year and a half, I retired um, from work, so that was a bit of a change. We had the, the P word, the pandemic, and I've had some other things going on in my life where I've felt God has been very, very distant, very, very distant. And I think part of that is because of the way I grew up. Uh, just to give you a little background about my father, my father was a, a tough guy, okay? He was a paratrooper. He fought in World War II. He fought in Europe against the Nazis. So he was a tough guy. Um, He had a great work ethic. So I never was, uh, didn't have food to eat or clothes to wear, nothing like that. But my father was very, very distant. I don't remember a time, and it may have happened, but I just don't know. I cannot remember a time that my father looked me in the eyes and said, I love you, Jim. Not one time. Because of the job that he had, he worked at night and he slept during the day. And I never got to see him. He never came to any of my ball games. He never came to anything. But he, was, he, but he wasn't really uh, you know, a terrible person, but I would say he really, was very neutral. I'll use that word. Um, there were times when he would become very angry um, at me for something I'm not even sure I even did. So that's not an example of a good father. So what I've been trying to do, actually talking with Rich for the last several weeks, is trying to sort some of this out. And I, and I think I am, and I've got something on my phone here, if I can get back to it. Oh, that's great. It just erased itself. That's good. Let me try, let me try that again. There's all kinds of, of, um, of verses that... I'm going to use your Bible, Rich. Is that Okay because my phone just decided to drop the network connection in here and use something else. Okay, let's find Romans. How many of you love the book of Romans? Yay. (laughs) All righty. But your Bible is different than mine. It's got different pages. Okay. (laughs) I'm really peddling to try and find this. Okay, here we go. Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but deliver him over to us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? I've been struggling with the fact, would God, would would you really give me all things? And that's kind of what I'm struggling with. And I'm not saying it's because of my father. It's a lot of things in life happen to a lot of, a lot of people, you know, but I don't think I had a really good natural look at what a father is like. So I'm struggling, so you pray for me, (laughs) okay? Okay, I think I'm done. (laughs) And we'll uh, just do that. Father, we thank you so much for Jim. He is so many things to us. And so many things to you. And right now, there just seems to be this distance or this blockage that really makes it difficult for him to see all those things that he is to you and you want to be to him. And so there's insecurity and there's concern, but there's also grace and love. 
And so we bless you, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he who did not spare his own son for you, but freely gave him to you. He will give you all things that you have need of. And Father, we just prophesy that this new season in Jim's life, from here until the time that you call him home, many days from now, from this time forward, I pray and I prophesy that he will feel loved of the Father. He will feel the love of the Father. He will see signs and evidences everywhere he turns. And the Father's love will remain in him, and he will give it to others. And he will father many in the faith. He will father sons and daughters in the faith. He and Joellen will father many sons and daughters in the faith, and he will be exactly what he needed. He will become what he was missing. And it will be your grace that does it. In Jesus' name, we bless you, Jim. Amen. Amen. In case you're ever wondering what happens when you go out to lunch with me, you know, am I going to ask you to do what I just asked Jim to do? No, I will only ask my dearest friends, the ones that I know and trust, to do something as courageous as what I asked Jim to do. So thank you, Jim, very much. It took much, much courage to do what you did. How many of you appreciate him? Could you just show him that? <clears throat> So in one sense, we're on a journey to learn how to be good sons and to be good daughters, right? But it's hard to be a good son. It's hard to be a good daughter oftentimes without having an example. So we look at Jesus and we say, okay, he is and was to his disciples such a great example of what it meant or what it looks like to be fully fathered and to respond as a son. And so then uh, he transferred his faith in the Father to those 12 men. And then those 12 men on the day of Pentecost with 120 others received the Father's blessing. He poured out, the Father said he would pour out his spirit or the very spirit that was on his son. He would pour out on the church. He would pour it out on those men and women who gathered together. And he poured out his spirit. In Romans uh, chapter 5, it says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So the love of the Father was poured into those men and women that gathered on the day of Pentecost. So they didn't just preach the gospel of Jesus Christ dying. Of course, that was the main event that just happened. This was the, this was the way back home. This was the, the thing that needed to be done that Jesus kept alluding to, but had not yet been done. So when the event happened, they started speaking of his death. They started speaking of his resurrection. But we don't understand is they also carried the message that this was all initiated by a father who was actually in love with the renegade world. So much so that he sent his son. So we have a couple uh, uh, slides. We're just going to put that first one up there, if you don't mind. And um, I'm going to just remind you that, uh, that from the day of Pentecost, then, then it went forward, you know. And, it, and, and of course, here we are 2,000-some years later, you know. And the question is, is the faith that we've received, is it really that faith? And I'm going to just say, I think that the gospel we've been preaching is actually the true faith. It's just missing one thing, and that's the motive. The motive was not like God one day saying, oh my gosh, these people, what am I going to do with them? I hate their sin, and I hate them. So we take the fear of God to mean that we're afraid of God. 
And the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the honor of God, the reverence. Why would God take the time to put right in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother? And then say of himself, well, you can dishonor me. Now, so <clears throat> the, the love factor, the father's heart is the thing that I really want to make sure. So number one, in getting this faith that was once delivered to us, once for all time, one time for all time, that faith that was delivered to the early church in, in, in a way, you know, for us, in order for us to recover it and have the right message and the right motives and the right heart in all of it, we have to add this piece about the Father. So the first thing I want to mention today, and it's just by way of review, is that Father God loves us. It, it has to start there. In John 16, verse number 27, John 16, verse number 27, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. Now, here's the big deal is like the Father puts emphasis on his Son. And he says, Listen, here's my Son. And the way you treat him is the way you're treating me. So if you respect my Son, then you have respect for me. That's easy. That's like fathership 101. If, if you want to insult me, insult my son. If you, if you want to, you know, bless me, bless my son, you know. It, it, that's not hard to figure out. That's, that's our reaction, our response is just a, a reflection of fatherhood as God created it. So, so here's the thing. He says, uh, the, the Father himself loves you. In other words, Jesus is basically saying, look, you, you got this all wrong. It's not me and you. Like, you're over there, and I'm like the, you know, the, the, the wonderful wife that is hiding the kids from the angry father so that, the, that he doesn't hurt the kids. If we get that message about Jesus, we got the wrong message. He's not the cop that keeps us, you know, like the father from unloading on us. And we say, well, Pastor Rich, what about the wrath of God? Read it. Read about the wrath of God. Every time that you see the phrase about the wrath of God, it is aimed at something, and it's not people. So Jesus is saying to these disciples, he said, look, you, you know, look, you, you, don't, you don't need me in order to have a relationship with the Father because he actually loves you himself. But you'll need me in order to be restored to the Father. And that was the, the, the tricky part there, right? Okay. So in other words, I don't have to do this. I don't have to die on a cross and raise again to make Father love you. The Father himself loves you. I, I don't know how many of you realize that that is revolutionary. Let's just take a minute and say to ourselves, Father God loves me. Father God, he loves us. It, it, it may surprise you to know that he even likes you. On the days when you're not sure you like me and I'm not sure I like you, the Father himself loves you. This, this is revolutionary when, the, when you suddenly realize that God is a good father and he loves us. So the verse says, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from him. In other words, Jesus is one time, again, he's saying, I came forth from the Father. Does anyone remember Christmas? What is, you know, like about, you know, is God Emmanuel coming to dwell with us? You remember that the word became flesh and dwelt among us? Do you remember that the, John says early in, in his, his gospel of Jesus, he said, no one has seen God at any time. 
No one has seen what he looks like. And I know some people are saying, well, what about Moses and Abraham? Yeah, okay, but I, John is saying no one has actually looked with their human eyes, looked on God. They don't know. But the but this father sent his son, and his son came from his bosom, from his heart. Okay, we don't use the word phrase or the phrase bosom anymore because it just sounds wrong. But let me just tell you something. If you were nurtured by a mother, you were in the embrace of your mother, and she literally gave you life and fed you and nurtured you and nourished you. And when she was doing this, she was doing because she loved you. So this is the image that John is trying to get us to see is that the Jesus came from the very embrace, the bosom of his father. And, and the father said, I want you to go and show them what I'm really like. So if you're thinking, as I've often been tempted to think, that Jesus is so amazing and I love everything about him, it's the father I'm just not so sure about because Sometimes he can come unhinged. I mean, have you seen what he did in Sodom and Gomorrah? Have you seen what he did with this worldwide flood? Have you seen the things that he has done and things that he has commanded? Let me just tell you something. If you don't see, if we don't see behind that a loving father, we've got the wrong lens. If you haven't seen the broken heart of a father whose actions oftentimes breaks his own heart. That's why Jesus told the story of a prodigal son. Can you imagine how insulting it would be in that parable for a young man to say, Dad, I really just don't need you, but I do need your money. Would you just give me your money? I mean, like, don't make me wait for you to die. Just give me your money, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to enjoy life. The prodigal son breaks the heart of the father. He never realizes the treasure was never in the money. The treasure was never in the stuff. The treasure was in the heart of that father who loved his son. He loved him so much that he allowed him to walk away knowing that he was going to make big mistakes. It would be very costly, very costly mistakes. And that father stood with tears running down his eyes when that boy walked out. Because he knew that all that the world had to offer, even though it might be a pleasurable moment, it would be a pleasurable event, it would be for a short season and a short space of time, and then suddenly you get, you wake up and you're 50, 55 years old, you're in your 50s and you're suddenly saying, what do I have to show for my life? I've wasted everything. I've, I've squandered inheritance. I've squandered relationship. I've blown up marriages. I've blown up my relationship with my kids. And why? Because I was pursuing something that was killing me. You can call it gambling. You can call it addiction. You can call it whatever you want. There's so many ways and so many different pathways in which this world can allure us into a deceptive belief that somehow God is holding out on us. And if, we, if you just give us the freedom, just give us the freedom to do what we want to and no one to tell me anything, I will enjoy my life. Until you find yourself broken and sick, riddled with disease, and the after effects of addiction, and no one wants to actually invite you to their home for the holidays because you've blown up your relationships. Father knows all that when the kid walks out the door. He knows it. He's seen it. He's not naive. He's seen it.
that the father goes outside that door, that same door that the kid walked out, and every day he looks and waits and watches and prays for that son to come home. And one day he thinks he sees him. It looks sort of like him, but not really. It's kind of like him, but so different. And his heart begins to churn with excitement. Could this be my son? This kid comes limping down the road, smelling, broken, hurting, lost, confused, embarrassed and ashamed. And in Jesus' story, you, you know, no, no respectable Jewish rabbi would ever have a parable, a story end with this. But what happens is that father, believing it could be his son, lifts up the edges of his robe and goes running to the son. You know, what should happen is that son comes and falls before you. That son confesses sin and grabs you by the ankles and says, I was an idiot, you were right, dad, and all this sort of thing. That father lifted up, hiked up the skirt of his robe and ran to that son because he never stopped loving him for a minute. And when they meet, he can see the scars. He can see the hurts and the wounds. He can see what the world has done to his son. But that doesn't change a thing. The kid stinks. He reeks. The father doesn't even notice. The father lifts him up and says, this son of mine who was dead is now alive again. And that kid felt anything but alive. He was like, when he went out the door, maybe he felt alive. When he went into town, he felt alive. When he was in the embrace of a woman, he felt alive. When he was drinking, he felt alive. But suddenly there came a payday and everything was ruined and he was broken and then he felt dead. And in his deadness, he has enough brain cells to return home and say, look, I'll just present myself as a servant to my dad. That's way better than this. And the father says he's alive. And the father begins celebrating he's alive. How many of you, when Jesus found you and began to speak over you, you said, I don't feel changed. I don't feel alive. I don't feel like anything has really happened, but I believe Somehow, some way, there could be actually a father who loves me. And I'll take the love. Even though I feel like I stink, I feel like I smell, I feel like I've got guilt, I feel like I still have shame. <laughs> Jesus proved that weak and wounded sinners are actually loved by the Father. Does our gospel message begin with God, our Father, actually loving us? If it doesn't, it needs changed. It needs to be changed. Let me just tell you something. In case you haven't noticed, in the last year or so, maybe a little bit longer than that, the world is not accusing the church of having way too much love. You guys are just way too loving. And the things that you're saying are too gracious. You are way too kind. Hello, report card day is here. Stand up with me. Today is the day to get this thing right. Today is the day to recognize the Father himself loves us. You are loved. You are loved with an everlasting love. He loved you so much that he shared his son with you, with me. 
Let me just say something. I have met a few. I've met a lot. I've met some wonderful sons and some wonderful daughters. If Jesus is as wonderful as the report about him is, what must his dad be like? If Jesus is so amazing and so grace-filled and so full of love, if he is so filled with unrequited, undeniable love, if it doesn't ever end, if it doesn't cease, if it doesn't give up, if Jesus is filled with that kind of unconditional love, then my question is, what's his dad like? I want you to turn to someone, put a hand on their shoulder, and start praying of them. The Father himself loves you. The Father himself loves you. You can let go of the performance thing. You can let go of trying to earn this. You don't have to do anything. To earn this, he, the Father himself, loves you. Turn to someone else and pray for them. Just pray. This is a very important, we, we, like I have other things I would share with you, but this is like, if we don't get this right, the rest of it doesn't make any more sense. The Father Some of you have heard that my story is that um, Judy was way, way, way more ready to be, you may be seated, a, a mother than I was to be a father. It's evident, right? She's a, uh, Judy is just like the ultimate mom, you know. <clears throat> Everything she does... It's just from a mother's heart, you know. And I had made sort of an agreement with her. We just came to grips with this when we got married. I said, you know, like, if we could just work together, work, both of us, be employed, about three years, and then we'd start a family. We were young. It's probably good we did wait a little bit. And the three years came. And... Uh, Judy was ready to remind me about our agreement. I think it was on the anniversary of three years. And somehow she got pregnant, you know. We started to plan to have a child and I barely looked at her and she got pregnant. The doctor said, you know what that means? And I'm like, we're in trouble? He said, uh, your wife is very fertile. And I am very scared. And I am very scared. And we started through the process in those nine months of adjusting our world and our thought to uh, having a baby. And um, the night that Judy decided to have this baby, I was sick. I was really, really, really sick. And um, she stepped out of the bed and she said, <gasps> my water broke. And I said, oh, no, you can't be, you can't, you know, this is, can you wait? Wait a second, what do you mean your water broke? In our bedroom. <laughs> How could you? <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> it was not as easy as we thought it might be, but um, David came into the world. And um, I, I wasn't allowed to hold him for 
a day or so because I was so sick, you know. And then finally they figured that uh, he was healthy enough and I was better enough that they suited me up in a hazmat suit and put David in my hands. And as soon as he touched my hands, something I never knew I had came, up, came alive. David could have been Rachel, could have been Rebecca, could have been someone else, you know. As soon as the child was laid in my hands, suddenly something came alive. It didn't really happen until I was actually holding David, you know. That suddenly I just wanted to be nothing more than a good dad. So, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes and the kids are very forgiving and gracious and thankfully Judy was steady right on the whole time we were planting a church and I was absent a lot and you know and lo and behold those children just kept coming and somehow they just partnered together with us and all the things I feared like I remember one time saying God I've never taught anyone how to speak English This child will probably speak in tongues before it speaks English. I knew how to do that. I didn't know how to teach someone to speak English. <clears throat> and I swear there'd be times I'd look in the mirror and I'd see my dad looking back at me. I miss him. But, you know, those things that, that mattered the most about him, he transferred to me, you know. And I think I missed a lot of steps in my own marriage and childbearing, but I feel like the things that mattered the most somehow got transferred. And God is gracious. God is kind. And there's nothing I'd love more than to just see each and every one of you have such a wonderful holiday season that, you know, you just feel your family's love and you feel honored and accepted and respected. But if that's not going to be your experience, I want you to know this. The rest of us will try to show that love to you imperfectly as, as we do, you know. But you've got to know this. No matter who you are or what your parenting parentage was like, there is a God who loves you more than you could ever possibly know. More than you could ever possibly know. And he shared his son with us. So, one last time, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. It's not because I don't know what to do. It's because I want you and me to just make an appeal right now. Because I don't know if you notice, but uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of kids that need loved. Um, my last point was going to be the father invites us home, you know, <laughs> no matter who you are. No matter what your language, there's a place in Father's house for you. No matter your age or your gender, your income, your sins, or your gifts, there's a place in Father's house for you, each one of you, each one of us. And I, I, the way God has wired me is that on Thanksgiving, like when I sit down and I start to eat, I think about it's not always the things that God has done for me it's the 300 meals that we served yesterday out of New Hope Ministries in Le Moyne and the 250 meals in Enola and the other eight centers and it's like that's way too many families thank God for New Hope Ministries but there are people who are hungry or starving or there are people 
who have no idea how much they are loved. And if they looked at their circumstance, they would probably assume what you and I often do is that somehow, some way, the Father doesn't really love us, but He does. He does. So I want you to be healthy. I want you to be well. I want your families to be thriving and well. And I want you to take this love and share it with someone else, anyone else, whoever God puts in your pathway. So I'm just going to ask you to put your hands out in front of you. <clears throat> put our hands out in front. How many of you believe that God can actually touch us in one service and change our lives? I, I, gotta, I, I just have to be honest with you. Like, if, if you came for good preaching, this is not the place to come. But if you want to be fathered, I guarantee you there are people here who will father you. I guarantee you there are people here who will parent you well. In fact, uh, we've got membership applications on the back, and I always felt guilty about asking people to join the church. It's kind of like asking someone to marry you. I only did that once, you know. Fortunately, she said yes. But look, if you feel like this is a healthy place, you might want to consider. Actually, the reason I put them out there is the Lord spoke to me recently, and he said, people need to belong. Right now, they're suffering from feeling so disconnected. They need to belong. They need to feel. So like church membership means almost nothing, and yet belonging means so much. So Father, I pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that your Holy Spirit... <clears throat> would be shed abroad in our hearts. We pray that God's love, the love of the Father, would be poured out on us by the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Whatever that looks like, we want more of it. We, we, we are <clears throat> woefully inadequate of loving and caring the love, Lord. Our vessels leak so badly. Our vessels are kinked and crimped and damaged and rusted and we have holes and we leak so badly, but help us to carry the love of God and share it with other people, Lord Jesus. Leaking vessels, broken vessels as we are, Lord, come and begin healing so that we can contain more and more and be poured out. And Father, I pray that we would learn that the more it is poured out, the more there will be available. The more we pour it out, the more there will be. This is not a zero-sum game. This is one of those things, the more of God's love that is poured into us, and the more that we pour it out, the more you pour into us God's love. So I pray in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would just begin pouring love into us right now and healing the vessels. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Praise your wonderful name. I'm so thankful that red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. How many of you know there's only one race, the human race? There's just many different languages. And so, Lord, we just pray through whatever our language group, whatever our language is, our, whatever our native tongue is, Lord Jesus, whatever our native country is or place, Lord. Oh, God, bring us all into Father's house. Bring us into Father's house. And I pray that week after week and month after month and year after year, as you give us time, that every time we gather together in this place, Lord Jesus, that the love of the Father would be poured out on us. And, and all those hurts would go away and all those wounds would go away. And our distorted filters, the way we see life, the way we view life, that are, it's, we know it's distorted. Oh God, heal us so that we see clearly so that we see, how many of you understand what I'm praying for right now? How many of you would pray for that yourself? Just say, oh God, I want, I want to be healed. I want to be healed in the Father's love. I want to know the Father's love. I want to know his embrace. I want to carry it. Carry it. I want to share it. I want to take that. As we share our faith, we want the love of the Father to go before anything else that we say. We want the love of the Father to go before anything else. Hallelujah. Serving God by loving people, right? Huh? Serving God by loving people. It's going to take the love of the Father. Oh, praise your name, Lord Jesus. Just go ahead and sing that song with Gary. Sing it. Hallelujah. <clears throat>
I just want to speak to you that are online right now. Just uh, the same thing can happen to you. The, 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 the Father's love can come right to where you are right now and touch you as well. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to know that the Father loves you so much that he gave his very best, his one and only son, so that you could come and be in his home. You could be in his house. You could become a member of the family of God. So we invite you to open up your heart and to receive that love. Let that love be shed abroad in your heart so that you can carry it, so that you can experience. Receive Jesus as your Savior. He's already received you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this people. They're so gracious and so kind, so beautiful, wonderful, and you're doing such incredible things in and through our lives. Now help us, we pray, to carry this love with us into this week. Help us to carry this love into our families as we meet around the table, Lord. I pray that there would be mention of the love of God at our tables. There would be reflections of the love of God and fathering at our tables, Jesus. Hallelujah. And as we move into a Christmas season, as we move into the holidays, we pray, Lord, that everything would be grounded and anchored in the love of God. Everything would be grounded and anchored in the love of God. We thank you. We praise you. Amen.